Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Janine, and I'm an alcoholic. I want to give a quick shout out to my parents that are here tonight. It's the first time they've heard me speak in person, and they're active Al-Anon. So now that I've said that, I'm going to pretend like they're not here now. I had them sit way, way over there, so I wouldn't touch their eyes. So, uh, my sobriety date is February 28, 2008. Um, and, and I want to thank Fifth Tradition for allowing me to speak here tonight. I think it's like super cool to get to speak at your home group. But uh, if you've ever gotten to travel a little bit and go to meetings in different places, every uh, meeting, kind of, every city or town or meetings all have their kind of nuances and everything. And in Charlotte. You, you don't tell people you're speaking. You maybe tell your sponsor and your sponsees, but you know you don't tell anybody else. It's just you just don't do that. So I get here and I, I become a member of the Fifth Tradition, and not only is it okay to tell people, but they send out an email to hundreds of people and they announce it in front of hundreds of people. <laughs> so if you're here tonight because I told you I was speaking, thank you for coming. I probably got carried away with that. So <laughs> I am an alcoholic. <laughs> I am from Lima, Ohio. Anybody ever heard of Lima, Ohio? Oh, wow, amazing. Okay, that's amazing. I think it has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. It is uh, an industrial town in the middle of, you know, farmland. You know, as far as you can drive, farmland everywhere. And it was one of those places that people stayed married forever, whether they should stay married or not. And I was um, raised... By a single mother. My, my father was close by, but my parents divorced when I was five. And my my mom worked hard. She played hard, and she was working on her master's um, for a number of years too. So she didn't have a whole lot of energy left for for us kids. And I suffered um, what I think greatly um, uh, some physical abuse and, and and definitely mental abuse at the hands of my sister. And I say that not because, I mean, that doesn't make me an alcoholic or anything. Although there's no alcoholism in my family as far as I can tell. And I know my family tree very decent and there aren't any alcoholics. But I say this because that resentment that I have for, for that part of my childhood kind of carries through this part of my story um, going forward. So I, uh, so things were difficult for me. And I was a I was a really good student, and I and I was involved with some extracurricular things. And when I turned 16, uh, I got a job and worked a lot. And so I was basically trying to do anything I could to stay out of the home. And that was um, pretty gratifying stuff. And I'm I'm always grateful that I did those things. But I remember the first time. I mean, I didn't go to the parties and stuff in high school. I really was a goody two shoes. But I remember the first time I got drunk. I was mad at the world. Um, my sister had yet again done something horrific, and the parents weren't doing anything about it. And I, I just I wanted to do some self punishment, I guess. So I got into my mom's liquor cabinet, got a bottle of bourbon out, and I still shiver thinking about it. But I got a bottle of bourbon out, and I drank as much of it as possibly to tolerate. And I went to work. <laughs> and I got my VW bug and went to work to my, a mile away. Anyway, I was working at Ponderosa, and <laughs> pretty cool, huh? I was working at Ponderosa, and they were actually letting me cook the steaks. Now it was pretty unheard of to the girls got to cook the steaks. That was definitely a guy job back then. But they were letting me cook the steaks, and I was burning it everything or sending it out raw. And they figured out pretty quick that I wasn't capable of doing that that night and sent me to the register, which is kind of stupid. So if I can't deal with the meat, how can I handle money? But I, I, I just went on past that, and I got in my car, and I passed out. And I came to, and I was in my works parking lot, and it was dark out, and all the cars were gone. And that meant that everybody I knew had walked past my car and saw me passed out in it. Uh, about, you know, the couple, next couple days I went back into the work and somebody had checked, time carved me out and nobody said a word to me about it. It really made me nervous that nobody said something. I never really wanted somebody to say something. I finally got my guts up like three months later asked my boss why um, somebody had done anything, said anything to me about it. And he said that I was a good kid and it looked like I was beating up on myself pretty bad that nobody else needed to, too. So, um, but that was my first drunk. Um, I don't know when my first drink was. 
So and alcohol didn't have that like magical thing for me. I hear some of you tell your stories and that first drink and you go right with the world and then that's your elixir for life. You know, that's just not my story. So I went off to college to a college with a really good football team. Shout out, right, Kai? Yeah, all right. Um, and here I was, free for the first time in my life. I was away from the, the, the tortures of school and the high school people who knew my sister and myself, and, and I was just totally free. And I, you know, I started, I could go out without worrying about somebody tattling on me or telling on me. Uh, yeah, I think some of the not drinking in high school is a fear of, of getting in trouble for it, too. So I got hooked up with um, Uncle Little Sis in a fraternity, and um, uh, met, met the husband, um, B, and father of my children. And we go out a lot. And we go out and we start drinking. God, it was fun to go out and do this sort of thing I was never able to do before. And, you know, uh, the, we'd go out on Friday and Saturday night and, and get pretty trashed. And then it started to happen that we'd go out on Thursday nights and, and Friday and Saturday. And, and then we had a little sis meetings on Tuesday. So we were going out Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And you're pretty hungover on Sunday, so you might want to have a little bit to drink to, you know, well, what you just did. Anyway, so I'm really good at drinking because I, I, what I found was if I could keep drinking longer, that's where all the fun was. I wanted to be where the fun was. And all these other girls were drinking way too much, and they were passing out, and they were missing all the fun. And that was okay. They could do that. So that's more for me. But what I, what I would do is I'd actually go to the bathroom. When I felt feeling a little lightheaded and my head would start spinning and stuff, I'd just go to the bathroom and make myself get sick, and then I could go back out and drink more and be part of the party. Now, I am not one who ever got – I don't think I ever got sick. From, um, from drinking. I, I would black out, but I, I never got sick, so the only time I got sick was when I um, self-inflicted it. So that was pretty fun. I, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I got out of college with um, a GPA that I don't recall because I've lied about what it is so many times, and the Ohio State University wants $35 of my money to tell me what it really is, and I think I will just not spend that money. <laughs> so, all I know is I've I passed. <laughs> anyway, so I did what a lot of people do when they get out of college. I got got a job. I got married. The guy dated all through college. Um, started having children, and things were fine. You know, I know that I was I didn't drink alcohol way back then because both times I was pregnant, I immediately as soon as I found out, I didn't drink anymore. And I didn't pick up another drink until I, uh, after I was done. You know being pregnant and, and done breastfeeding. And it was no effort whatsoever. It just, that's what you do when you're pregnant. You just do it, right? So that's what I did. So I know at that point in time, I certainly had a choice in whether I drank or not, right? Which would sincerely change considerably later on. That marriage ended um, to no fault of my own. Um, even my ex-husband um, said to me when I asked him for the divorce that, um, that this was not my fault, that um, I had done everything I could to keep the marriage together. And, you know, he didn't have to say that, but it was nice to hear it. And it was a very amicable divorce. But I jumped into relationship number two right off the bat. And this gentleman, and I just didn't realize it. I just didn't pick up on these things. You know, all this was new to me. And, and, you know, every time we'd go out, we drank. And you could, and that's kind of what you do when you're dating, right? And so when we started spending every day together and then, Eventually, when we were living together, we, we, we drank every day. And it just didn't, it just didn't notice the fact that when he came to my place after working all day, he had a tall boy that he was having to throw away. You know, so he was drinking on the way after work. And, you know, and, you know, we'd drink, you know, in the evening after the kids went to bed and, and maybe overdid it a bunch on the weekends. We didn't have the kids. So he had two kids the same age as my two kids. So we had four kids between the two of us. So we had some weekends. We didn't have any kids. But I'll tell you what. He was, he was a good guy. He was a nice guy. Everybody liked him. I think he always meant well. Uh, he came from a family with a, a lot of alcoholism, though. I, at least I, too, I, I believe that. I can't call anybody else an alcoholic, but I can tell you this. He absolutely drank considerably more than I did. But I just didn't notice it. I really just didn't notice it. And I don't know why. But I know from the day that I started living with him for the next 13 years, I drank every day. Now, I didn't start off with a lot and getting trashed or anything like that or catching a buzz necessarily every night, but it was a gradual, gradual, very slow progression. You know, at first, you know, 
we don't really drink too much on the weekends, or at least for myself, maybe he drank more than that, I don't know. Or I'd wait till the kids were in bed, and I'd have a glass of wine after they went to bed. You know, and then it would be that, okay, well, I'd have a glass, or, you know, to have something to drink after dinner. And then I started switching from, you know, the wine and beer to mixed drink, with rum and Diet Coke. And then, slowly over the years, it became more and more rum and less and less Diet Coke. And, and it became, you know, instead of uh, waiting till after dinner, it would be while you're cooking dinner to uh, starting when, as soon as you got home from work. Right, and so alcohol started having more prominent and prominent uh, place in my life. You know, I had no idea at what point I crossed that invisible line, but at some point I no longer had a choice in whether I drank or not. I do start. So I started picking up on it. I started, I started getting clues. You know, I was. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always on a diet. <laughs> And drinking alcoholically while being on a diet is kind of hard to do and be successful, right? So, you know, I would always do, like, Weight Watchers, who's got the points, and I'd end up drinking all my points. Because <laughs> it didn't say you couldn't drink alcohol, right? And then they came out with the Atkins diet. Well, there's some, there's some alcohol with no carbs in it. So I, I could do this and, and drink as much as I wanted to. That's so I really enjoyed that. But I'm guessing that normal people don't have to consider which diet they're going on based on how much they want to be able to drink. <laughs> yeah, I was, um, I was drinking and driving every day, not only with my kids in the car, but with other people's kids in the car. I would have this big Tupperware cup, and I'd have my rum and Diet Coke in it, and, you know, kids are thirsty all the time, right? And you go pick them up from school or whatever, their friends have some stuff, and they say, Mommy, I want a drink. And, no, you can't have that. Oh, it's Mommy's special drink. So they knew that if it was Mommy's special drink, they couldn't have any of it. And, you know, I don't know if any of the parents ever knew about it or not, but we started, my husband and I, then we started making decisions about so uh, being places and leaving places so that we could drink like the way we wanted to drink. You know, we, we partied a lot at home. We thought we were good parents because we were home a lot. Well, it's because we didn't want to go out and drink and drive, right? And we lived in Peachtree City, so we had golf carts, so we could still kind of get around and, and, and not be a problem. <laughs> back then, they didn't have a drinking limit on the golf carts. Some, some politicians screwed that up for everybody. But anyway, back then, it was cool. <laughs> um, it was, I mean, we did, we'd do things like, you know, go to the football, football game, the high school football game, and we'd leave at half time because we wanted to get home and start drinking. And we just tell people it's because the football team sucked. Who would want to stay for the second half, right? <laughs> and, you know, we'd go to family events, you know, Christmas, holidays, and stuff like that, and we'd always have it planned ahead of time what time we were going to leave so that we could get home and could continue drinking. Because you can go to these family events, and it's okay to drink, you just didn't want to get drunk there. So we only wanted to try to control our drinking for a certain amount of time, or we'd want to, um, you know, want to get out of there. And I, I tell you, we'd, we'd leave and we'd stop the quick trip immediately. And we already had our, our, you know, Canadian Mist or Crown Royal, whatever it was, in the car, so we could, you know, get that big gulp cup and and and, and mix the drink, so we could drink that all the way home in the hour drive. So we had all these decisions we were making based on, on being able to drink. So things started really spiraling down for us. Uh, and I, I, one of the cool things about all this is his stepfather, my ex-stepfather-in-law, uh, was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And every time they would come to visit us, he would kind of slip away and go to a meeting. And he never said a word to us about our drinking, never said a word to us about Alcoholics Anonymous. So I think he was like this beautiful um, example of Alcoholics Anonymous, that, you know, it's attraction rather than promotion, and he certainly was that. And, you know, I, I, he never judged us, never, ever judged us. But my thinking at the time was, you know, selfish and self-centered if I am, that, wow, at the time he had 13 years of sobriety, and I thought, oh, my God, 13 years of sobriety, and he still has to go to meetings. He's still weak. And that's what I thought. And I never asked him. And, you know, what I didn't know was that he had long since needed to drink, that he was going to meetings because he wanted to go to meetings. But because it was my house and I didn't give a damn about him whether he wanted to drink or not, it was my house and I was going to drink. His his alcoholism was his problem. So anyway, so things were taking uh, the alcohol was really, really, really I think interfering with our lives and and uh, certainly with my husband. And um, he um, I was I, I said to him one time I said we need to stop drinking. We're alcoholics. You know, it was very clear to me that I, I was an alcoholic. I knew. I could not not drink. 
You know, I was just gonna play games with myself, not drink until later, and I'd, I'd, I'd cave in every time. I changed my mind and drink. You know, that was what it always was. I, I, I didn't think I, I, I couldn't do it. I thought I had changed my mind, but it became really clear to me that this was a problem. So I asked him and said, "Let's go get some help. Let's go to Alcoholics Anonymous." And he said that he was not an alcoholic and that he could quit drinking anytime he wanted to, and he just didn't want to today. You know, I did not know about Al-Anon back then. Probably would have gone, which would have probably gotten me into these rooms. Uh, I, I didn't, hadn't gotten to any kind of bottom where I wanted to go to Alcoholics Anonymous himself. So I thought he was my problem, and I divorced him and got rid of him. Quite sure he was the problem, and everything was straightened up. Well, he might have had a problem, but I certainly did too, and that caught up with me really quick because here I've been married essentially for 20, 20 years between the two, the two husbands, and I did not know how to, to meet people, and I was lonely and, and depressed, and you know, what do lonely, single, depressed, middle-aged women do? No, at least this one went out to the bars. We hung out at Longhorn. <laughs> Big times in Peachtree City. <laughs> And I found other single, lonely, middle-aged people, too. And uh, we did all, uh, you know, if you can imagine, that, that's what we did. It, it, it was sad, it was pathetic. You met people, you, you lied, you, you did things, you, you, you know, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I mean, that's really what it was. And, you know, I always hang out with people that had worse problems than I did. Because if they had worse problems than I did, then I felt better about myself. They needed me because I was doing well, you know. Uh, one of my friends had lost his job. He had three DUIs and kicked out of the apartment. Anyways, he ended up in jail for all these multiple DUIs. And he got kicked out of jail for a, like a ruptured colon or something like that. And so he was in the hospital, and I stopped to see him on the way to work. I had quit my absolute favorite job in the world, absolute favorite job ever. I had left there because my newer manager, I thought, was making all the wrong decisions. And I took a job where everybody who, who knew me and, and knew what kind of work I did told me I would be deathly bored. And, and so I took a job with the government. And uh, and they were right. I was deathly bored, and I could do that job with my hand tied behind my back, and that's essentially what I was doing with my all my heavy drinking is doing the job with my hand tied behind my back. But on my way to work, I stopped to see him at the hospital, and I had been drinking on the way to work. I would, I would um, I'd make a drink and take it with me because it was an hour drive. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this person that I thought had severely worse problems than I did was concerned about me and called my parents and told me he was worried about me. So here's this person, got kicked out of jail, is worried about me. So that got my parents kind of involved. I, I think they were already very concerned about me a lot. And uh, I, so I went to a couple AA meetings and I went in there and I compared myself to everybody in there. They were old and I was young, or they were young and I'm old. That's a stay-at-home mom. She has no idea what it's like to have to be a working mom. Uh, you know, it was you know I was just comparing myself to everybody, and I, and I had I couldn't imagine staying in those rooms. <coughs> Things kept getting bad, and and I actually went to Anchor Hospital. I think that's the name of it here in South Atlanta, and we we chatted a bit. I mean, I didn't argue with them whether I was an alcoholic or not. And they said, you know, well, we'll check you in now. I was like, oh, no, I've got a conference in Disney World this week. I can't go. And I said, well, when you come back, why don't you come here to the hospital? So I actually packed a bag so that as soon as I got off the plane on my way back, I would uh, I'd go to Anchor Hospital. Well, I went to Disney. I went to this conference. So lots of people I had a great time, won a professional award. And here I was coming back. And I just, on the way back, I just didn't drink as much on the way back. So when I got to Anchor Hospital, uh, they wouldn't accept me because I wasn't, they wanted me to be detoxing and I wasn't drunk. And so I said, you mean you're telling me that I should go home and dr get drunk before I can come back in here? And they said, well, no, not really. But anyway, so I left and I stopped it right at the, the quickest store I could find and, and got those cheap little twist top bottle of wine and drank it on the way home and started getting trashed. And the anchor hospital called me back and said, we made a mistake. Can you come back? And I, and I said, no, I've been drinking. You don't need to drink and drive, do you? Okay, so I did drink and drive every day, but I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I did, uh, I did go to Anchor the, ne the next morning, and I stayed for three days. 
And, you know, I know the AA brought some meetings in there, and I thought, I thought oh God, how pathetic this people bringing meetings into those places. And, you know, I thought maybe this was torture for them or something like that, you know. Um, of course, I've done that a lot since then, and I, and I love to do it. I didn't know. But, yeah, I don't really remember much of it, except when I checked out of anchor, the doctor told me my diagnosis was that I was a situational drinker. I knew I wasn't a situational drinker, right? Um, but he'd give me like this golden ticket to go tell people that I'm a situational drinker, so I could go on and keep on drinking. You know, I, you know, the other two people that were affected by this a lot were my children. Um, uh, my oldest daughter was off in college by this point, but she was close. And then my youngest daughter, I think she was like 15, and uh, I wasn't home a lot for her, and when I was, I had friends over, and I was drunk, and I was in complete embarrassment to her, and that poor baby, I blamed it on her why I wasn't home. I told her she made, made it miserable for me to be home, and that's why I wasn't home. I blamed it on that baby. And um, her father and I decided that it might be better for her to go live with him in Gwinnett County, that he's in a family unit, and that might be better than uh, living with, um, you know, a, a single mother. And, you know... I, had, I don't know about you all, but I had intended to, when I had my children, to raise them, <laughs> complete wisdom of raising them. And I essentially lost um, finishing raising my daughter to, um, to this disease. Uh, so she went to her father's house, but without any kids still in the house, I really went off the deep end. I mean, there was just nobody to be accountable for whatsoever, and there was no excuses whatsoever either. And... I went back to a couple more AA meetings, and I, I just couldn't get it. I mean, just I just didn't understand these people. I just didn't think I would ever, I mean, I would be just sentenced to a horribly boring life if I if I stuck with this. And on top of it, I was going out of the country for, for, for five weeks for, for work and then for vacation. But this guy I had been dating. I, I was dating this guy long distance from, um, from Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, this place, this country I was going to, I, I looked on the Internet, and I couldn't find any AA meetings, so I just said, forget it, I'm, I didn't bother I was trying to get sober. And, and I certainly didn't want to not drink with the guy, right? Because I don't want him to know I've got a problem. And because he and I had a whole lot of fun drinking together. But while we were on that trip, he suggested that I move to Charlotte and we could date like normal people. I heard, why don't you move to Charlotte? We'll fall in love and live happily ever after. And I'll make your world right. He had no intentions of doing any of that. None. Oh my God, he had no idea what. He never wanted to be anybody's night shining. His idea of dating like normal people was once a week, maybe. But, anyways, I didn't know this, and I was sure that moving to Charlotte was the absolute right thing to do. That I would uh, get away from my people, places, and things, and, and, and start a new life, a new job, a new career, this relationship. Oh my God, all this is going to fix me, and I'd still be able to drink. Right, if, you know, get all these these pieces back together again. Sold my house. You know, moved everything I had up to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Left my, my my daughter, my youngest daughter, who was four, she would never speak to me again. You know, left her, left my older daughter and my parents who are here in Atlanta, and moved to Charlotte. And I tell you what, when I when I got there and I was, the first day going to work, and the, 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 they have a whole vibrant downtown there. And I remember walking into my work and just wanting to throw my hat up the air like that girl and say, "Ooh, you know, <laughs> this is my new life." You know, I was so excited about my life. Well, uh, that gentleman um, pretty quickly figured out I expected him to be a uh, bit spent all his time with me, and I, I had a whole lot more expectations than he had any intentions of, of meeting. And Everything just collapsed really fast. I mean, like, all of a sudden it started collapsing. And I didn't have any friends. You know, I didn't know anybody. And, you know, I expected him to be everything for me. So I, I started going back out to the bars again. And he broke up with me a couple times. And, and I'd go out to the bars. And, you know, I went right back to that same behavior, exactly the same behavior as I had before. And, you know, I'll talk to anybody. And, you know, <laughs> I think one of the scariest things that ever happened to me while I was drinking was, I drank myself sober. I think one night I had so much alcohol in me. I had to be completely off the Richter scale, drunk, and I was stone cold sober. And I knew not being another drop would have changed that. And that was scary. Alcohol had to completely stop working for me. That was scary. 
Right, so I was, you know, and you go out and you go to bars and you like, you know, you have six really bad days, but then on that seventh day you had a lot of fun and met some people, right? And so I said, oh, I can still do this. This is still going to work for me. Anyway, I, um, I was over at this guy's house and I had been completely trashed on my way over there because I was so uncomfortable in a relationship and I don't remember anything else after about 15 minutes being there. And what I found out later on was that I had gotten completely drunk. He wanted me to leave. Um, he called a cab for me to go. I wouldn't do it. And he called the police on me. What I remember is I woke up the next morning and uh, I was at home, splitting headaches, no car. I called a cab, got a, went to get my car, and he wouldn't answer the door or anything. And I'll tell you what. I mean, and this was my bottom. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, my God, I hate my job. I can't go back to it. I can't go back to Atlanta because they pay a lot of the the company had paid a lot of money to get me there. I don't have the money to pay them back. I don't have anywhere to go to anyways. And you know, I got to the point where I didn't want to live, but I didn't want to die. And um, I keep in mind that during all this, I don't believe in God at all. Don't even talk to me about God. In fact, I need to write my mother a letter telling her I don't believe in God. I'm glad you believe in God, but don't talk to me about God. So my foxhole prayer, you know, wasn't God, please help me. It was mom, please help me. And I called my parents and my mom. And um, instead of being five hours away, she was only an hour and a half away because they were coming back from a trip. And they were just at the point in their trip where they could have gone home to Atlanta or they could come to Charlotte. So they were really close. And they came and got me. And I talked at my mother's house. And, you know, I didn't ask for God's help, but God helped me. I, I see that now. Um, so when I got back, you know, because I was at a new job, they could have fired me for any reason, and then I would all, all this money back. I couldn't go to a, a, a detox center or anything like that. I had to do this myself. And I went to an AA meeting, and it was a really small one, and I'm sitting there thinking, everybody was like 25 years sober and ancient. And, oh, my God, I'm never going to be able to do this. But I went to another meeting the next day, and there were a whole bunch of really young people. Now I started realizing I needed to go to, go to a couple meetings, and... Uh, I picked up three white chips in about three weeks. Um, that last one, you know, but I kept going to meetings. I kept going to meetings, and you know, I was just I had to make this work. I had to make this work, whether I liked it or not. And that last, that day of my last drink, I had gone to the counselor, and we had talked about my horrible childhood again. That inner child stuff, Ugh. and. I had driven home, and that was just too much burden on my brain. I couldn't have it. I had no, no solution, right? And the only solution I had at that point was a drink. So I pulled over to a bar I'd never been to before. I sat down, started talking to this guy who doesn't even like women, and we were doing shots of tequila, lemon and salt, and having a delightful conversation. And I heard this voice, as clear as day. I remember it to this day, saying, Janine, you can't spend the rest of your life sitting in the car talking to strangers. Just that simple. So I got my drunk let off the, the chair, and I went to the Tim Cam meeting. It was a candlelight meeting. I thought that was cool because nobody would recognize me and you see me. And so I, um, I, I picked that up. Turns out to have been my, my last white chip that night. And yeah, I got a sponsor, and I started working these steps. And I'll be forever grateful to the young people in this program. They were the first ones who started inviting me to, to talk. And they were the first ones who started uh, teaching me how to laugh. Oh, my God. Ask me, not, I'm not saying this at the podium, but ask me what stupid game they had about replacing a word in the movie titles and making them funny. It's dirty. But anyways, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but it got me laughing, and it got me out of my head. And I didn't think I would ever laugh again, right? Uh, but they, they were pretty cool. And I remember I was still pretty miserable, and I was... Uh, I called my sponsor, and I, you know, I was just miserable. I wanted to drink, and and just falling to her uh, at the bottom of my stairs. And I, and she said, Janine, you're gonna have to find a power greater than yourself. And I said, This is not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Well, she got. It. And she told me, Well, can you make a list? And it's like, Okay, I can go. I can do that. A list. I can do a list. Because if there were a God, what would that God be like? And I was like, Crap. She's trying to trick me. <laughs> but. And yeah, I had that beautiful, beautiful gift of desperation. I did everything my sponsor suggested. I was out of choices. I was out of ideas. Nothing I, as 
smart as I think I am, nothing I could come up with worked. So I was willing to try somebody else's ideas. I mean, she didn't ask me to do anything that hurt me or weird or, you know, anything like that. But so I made this list, and I still got it today. And it's a really simple list. It's like a God that would let me laugh again. You know, it's just really simple stuff, but I made this list. A couple weeks later, it occurred to me that although things weren't great yet, I hadn't wanted to have a drink as my solution. And immediately, I tied that to when I had made that damn list. And it's like, so that was my spiritual awakening for me. It's like, oh, my God. You know, I had been my own higher power for an awful long time, and some other people's too. And so alcohol had become my higher power. It had more control over me than I did. So it was going to take a power greater than alcohol to relieve me of my desire to quit drinking. And so I immediately tied the fact that I had made this list to my not wanting to have a drink anymore. And it, it, it just happened. I mean, it was just magical for me. And, I, you know, I, all of a sudden I, I started smiling again, and I started enjoying going to meetings, and I, I started getting my runaround buddies, and we started doing stuff together and calling each other and complaining about our sponsors with each other and, and you know, deciding which meetings we liked and didn't like. And, oh, my gosh, it, it started to be fun. I started to have fun. I started feeling part of. And, boy, these steps were something. I remember when I was... Three months over, my sponsor said to me, she goes, you need to start reaching your hand out to newcomers. And I go, ooh, well, I don't have anything that a newcomer wants, you know? You know, what am I going to say to them? And she said, you know, you know how to stay sober for three months. And they don't. And so, oh, okay. So I'm still doing what my sponsor says to me. And I, I was at a big meeting similar to this one. And there was this girl standing over smoking by herself, looks totally petrified. And I went up and introduced myself to her. And started talking to her, and I said, well, why don't we go, and it was, she said she'd, you know, been to meet one other meeting that weekend, it was her first time, and I said, let's go grab some coffee, and we went and grabbed some coffee, and I started talking to her about, you know, we do that, we drive with our eye, hand over her eyes, so we can see one line instead of ten lines out there on the road, and I told her that I used to do this, and, and, and she goes, oh my God, I used to do that too, and she thought she was the only one who had ever done that, <laughs> and, and I talked about how, I, know, I hated waking up this morning and, and after I hadn't been blacked out because you know, first you look to see these cars outside. It's there. Check to see my cell phone. Oh my God, I talked to him for 10 minutes. I wonder if we're still speaking. You know, I don't know, right? And the worst, even yet, there's evidence of this, is the email sent. I, for things I was, thought were quite brilliant philosophical ideas that you needed to hear. <laughs> and I look at them, and they're completely incoherent and run on sentences, and, you know, I wish I could hit the resend button. Come back. I don't want you to go out. But anyway, and she said, oh, my God, I did those things, too. You know, so she immediately started identifying. And we became um, pretty good friends, but I went home that night with this, this beautiful feeling. It's like, oh, my God, I get alcoholics anonymous now. It's like, this is how this thing works. It's one alcoholic sharing with another alcoholic. You know, uh, it, it was just like, no wonder this works. And it is that simple. It really is. And, you know, I, I don't know if I, it, it wouldn't have mattered if I had ever seen her again or not. That, that elation from having been able to help somebody else with, with that identification was just to set me on fire. I mean, it, it, was, it was beautiful. I... So I went on with the rest of steps and stuff like that, and I started to get really involved in AA and finished my steps and started sponsoring and, and you know, got on a steering committee for one of the conferences, and I'm doing the deal, right? Doing the deal. Having a lot of fun doing it. And I got some information, I was about 13 months over, and I got some information that just stirred up some old memories from my childhood, and instead of talking to my sponsor about it and letting it go, Started thinking about it, and thinking about it some more, and thinking about it some more, and reliving these memories, and stirring up more that I had forgotten, really hashing it out. And about a week later, after being sure I've got this, it was a beautiful Saturday spring day, and I wanted a drink worse than anything. And I knew where I'd go to get it, I knew what I was going to make, I knew what I'd say to my sponsor if she ever thought to call me again. I wouldn't go to any more AA meetings. And you know what? I'd probably end up in dying from this. And you know what? It would be her fault. Now, is that insane thinking? It is. It is. And that scared me. And I uh, got down on my knees right away and um, asked God to remove the desire to drink from me. And it didn't go away. And I tried to get myself busy doing something else around the house to take my mind off of it. And it wouldn't go away. I picked up the phone and called my sponsor. 
Couldn't get a hold of her, so I called another alcoholic and um, talked to my uh, my friend for maybe an hour on the phone. So my sponsor called me back, and I talked to her, and we we got together and we met, and we talked about it. We talked about it, and and uh, um, she said, you know, maybe you might want to go talk to somebody else about this. But anyways, I had to leave her because I had to go to a meeting early because I was meeting with a newcomer. I had just got to sponsor where I had to share with her my experience with these friends. And then I was at a meeting, and then after that meeting, I was hanging out with a friend. And, you know, by the end of that day, I was on top of the world. The end of the day, I was on top of the world. I had a great day. I had a great day. You know, um, I've learned so many lessons from this. You know, uh, first of all, all the things you guys taught me about how to avoid having a drink in the world. And I didn't need just one of them. I needed every single one of them. And being in the middle of this thing is seriously important to me because even today, you know, I, I stay in the middle of this thing because... Um, I'm not sure what combination of things I did back then that kept me from the drink, but <clears throat> let's say I um, I stopped going to detox. You know, is that that secret extra nugget that keeps me from um, from drinking or staying in the middle? Or what if I stopped going to as many meetings? Maybe that's it. You know, you know, I, I don't know what combinations of things I'm doing today uh, keep me from um, picking up a drink, but I'm not willing to find out. I'm not going to play Russian roulette with all that. So, you know, uh, and I also remind, it reminded me so blatantly clear how powerful this disease is. It's just lurking there to, to, to come up there and grab me. Just lurking right there. So, you know, uh, you know, here is my resentment. So I don't know if you picked up on this, but my first drunk, my last drunk, and then I almost drank again in sobriety were over the same resentment. So, um, resentments are... Uh, Pretty powerful this program. I, uh, is there anybody in here who didn't come into alcohol synonymous with some serious resentments? <laughs> all right. So, I mean, I think we all have them um, pretty strongly, and, and this is something that needed to be dealt with. And, it, you know, and even though I had gone through my ninth step and done all those things, I, I, I was still feeling it, right? And I, uh, I certainly did what I could about that. It wasn't until maybe... You know, I, I did what the book said, getting on my knees and praying for the other person and doing it every night for a couple weeks and stuff like that. And, and that, that was helping some, but it really wasn't, wasn't knocking it out for me. And I mean, that's the resentment that I always had. I mean, I didn't even know who I was without this resentment. I don't ever remember not having it. And it's kind of part of who I was. You know, it wasn't until I heard at one of the conferences or something, I was listening to the al speaker say something I probably had heard a hundred times before, but that night I heard it. You know, it's basically, am I going to allow that person to have more power over me than God? It's like, hell no. <laughs> Not a chance. And it snapped to me. It went, it went, it went, that, that resentment went. It's like the, the most beautiful uh, weight off my shoulders. It was incredible. Uh, absolutely incredible. So, you know, it, it, all that was really important. And I was horrifically, uh, Embarrassed that this had happened to me. My sponsor told me that this um, would probably be one of my stronger stories that I'd be sharing with other people about how to um, not drink when presented with this, uh, a strong urge. So there's that, that part of my story. I I can't tell my story up here without talking about service. Now I've probably gone a little over the deep end with with service. I, I think I've tried absolutely every possible role and, and uh, venue that you can think of as an alcoholic phenomenon. I got a lot of energy <laughs> and I gotta do something with it. And you know, if if I'm not thinking about doing something else, I'm gonna be in my head thinking about me. So doing this sort of thing is really a really awesome. So any of you are just intimidated or not sure what you want to do, try it all. Find out what you like. I mean that's kinda of what I did with my kids. They didn't know what sports they'd be good at or what they'd like. You know, so they tried them all and they found the things that they were really good at. You know, that's kind of what I've done with AA. There's lots of opportunities to do different things. You know, you know some, people, some women are just fabulous, great sponsors and have a whole houseload of them and stuff. Some other people, are, you know, are really great in general service and, 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 and do that. You know, some people just really love going into the jails. You know, some people, you know, and, and carrying the message there, you know, whatever it is, there's lots of opportunities to do this thing. And I have never, ever come out of any of those um, doing some of those things without feeling completely rewarded and having done so and understanding why we're doing this. Just, uh, you know, so if, if you've got any questions about any of us, I'd love to share it with you. And I I had some people point it out here in the audience were supposed to tell me to slow down, but they didn't do that, so maybe I didn't talk too fast. But I always finish a little pad early for some reason. But um, oh, I do want to say that uh, one of the, the big beautiful things about uh, 
my pack and Alcoholics Anonymous with my move here to Atlanta. Um, you know, I've been gone for five and a half years, six years, and my parents said to me last over the holidays last year that um, asked me when I was coming back to Atlanta. And I looked at them and said, I don't know, I guess now. You know, it just hadn't occurred to me that I should just come back to Atlanta. And you know, what made me feel good about that idea was it wasn't mine. <laughs> I don't really trust my ideas, right? Anyway, so I talked to my sponsor and I talked to some other people about it. And, you know, I just took the next right steps, you know, started looking for jobs, started looking for a place to live, and I was in no rush to do it. Alcoholic gene back in those days, like I did when I moved to Charlotte, it's like, got the idea, I'm throwing everything at it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to think this through, this is the right decision, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force the situation. And with my move here to Atlanta, I just got out of the way and let God do the driving, and everything unfolded in front of me. I mean, it was just it's so painless and stress-free. It was absolutely a, a beautiful experience, and I think it's one of my stronger um, feelings of trusting God, because uh, every time I had a little bit of fear in, in, in some of the things, you know, it's also reminding me, God's got this. God's got this. So uh, that, and I, I'm finding you all here. It's been an incredible blessing because I've mean, met some many wonderful friends. And you've got such good sobriety here and, 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 and busy and service and all like that. So I'm gonna. I have a story that I, I heard somebody tell one time, and I just love the story. And I'd like to share it with you tonight. So be principal, Lord. And, um, bear with me. So one day there was a drunk, and he was in a hole, and he couldn't get out of the hole. No matter how hard he tried, he can get out of the hole. And one day, uh, a banker came walking by, and he yelled up to him, Hey, can you help me get out of this hole? And the banker said, Sure, and he wrote him a check and tossed it down, and he says, Here, here's the money. Get yourself out of the hole. Well, he spent the money, and he was still stuck in the hole. So a little while later, a, uh, psychiatrist came, a psychologist came walking by, and the drunk hollers up and says, Hey, can you help me get out of this hole? And the psychologist sat down and talked to him about um, you know, his childhood and everything was his mother's fault and, and maybe he should do these things differently. And, and the, the, the psychiatrist had to leave because uh, he had to go work with another patient. He told me that that same time next week and here's your bill. You know, but he felt better. He knew a little bit more about himself and everything, but he was still stuck in this hole. So a little while later, a, a preacher comes walking by and he hollers up at him and says, Hey, preacher, can you help me get out of the hole? And the preacher says, Sure. And he sits down and he talks to him about God and they say some prayers and, and, uh, but, uh, and sang some songs. And the, uh, the preacher had to go. He had other people to preach to. And the, uh, he felt better. He felt a connection with God. And, but you know, without anybody else really to practice this new faith and everything, he just kind of went on the wayside and he prayed a little bit less. And he did, you know, and, and he sang the songs a little bit fewer times. And he was still stuck in this hole. So one day, an alcoholic comes walking by, and the drunk hollers up at him and says, hey, can you get me out of this hole? And the alcoholic says, sure, and he jumps in the hole. And the drunk's like, ooh, what did you do that for? Now we're both stuck in the hole. And he goes, yeah, but I've been in this hole before, and I know the way out. Thank you all for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.